Welcome to the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee's eighth meeting of 2019. Before we move on to the first item on our agenda, can we uh, remind everyone to switch off their mobile phones as they may affect the broadcasting system? Um, we have apologies from Claudia Beamish, member of the committee. The first item on the agenda is for the committee to take evidence on the Conservation Natural Habitats Amendment Scotland Regulations 2009. Uh, that's SSI. 2009 oblique 64. This morning I'm delighted to welcome Hugh Dignan, Head of Wildlife and Protected Areas, and John Gray, Policy Officer from the Scottish Government, and also joining us today are Ben Ross from Scottish Beaver Project and Scheme Manager of National Operations, and Martin Gaywood, Species Action Framework Manager of Ecosystems and Biodiversity Unit of Scottish Natural Heritage. Good morning to you all. Um, I'll ask some uh, initial questions before I open up to my colleagues. Um, can, can you outline the process? I suppose that, um, uh, for Hugh Dignan, uh, my question. Can you outline the, the process that Scottish Government and SNH have gone through in order to bring forward these regulations since the announcement was made in 2016 that the Government was minded to grant beavers uh, protected, uh, European protected stat status? Yes, of course. Um, I guess broadly there are sort of two, two strands of, of, of work which we've undertaken in that time. Uh, the first of those was a, a couple of technical exercises. So there was um, an exercise uh, under the Habitats Directive to do a Habitats Regulations Assessment to assess the extent to which uh, allowing beavers to stay and giving them protected status would have an impact on other protected species and protected sites. So that piece of work was required to be done and indeed was done and completed and has been published. And, a, and in a similar vein, there was also a strategic environmental assessment which looked uh, at the uh, impacts you know, on, on wider environmental issues of allowing beavers to stay. And so that was a pretty significant piece of work involving a public consultation and assessment of the impacts and so on. Again, that piece of work uh, took some time to do, but it was completed and published uh, late last year, I think, was when it actually finally made it to the website. So that was a sort of the technical uh, and, and formal process that we needed to go through. But alongside that, it really was a matter of ensuring that stakeholders really understood what we were doing, and that they were, and that we were, had the chance to listen to their concerns and to work with uh, our colleagues in SNH to design a management system that would. Uh, provide the, the legal protection for beavers, but at the same time be flexible enough to ensure that land uses like agriculture and forestry and fisheries and so on could continue to, to operate in, in, a, in, a, in a pretty unimpeded fashion. And where do you hope that we'll be in five, ten years' time now that these regulations are in place? What are you hoping for? Well, I hope in terms of the management system that we will have... Um, developed our understanding and we'll have learnt how to manage beavers in a Scottish context. I'm not anticipating that it'll be hugely different from other European countries who have similar land uses and similar issues with beavers. But you know there will there will inevitably be some Scottish aspects to the the way we manage beavers. So we will learn that. And in terms of the beavers themselves, I hope that they will be contributing to the biodiversity of Scotland by the sort of wetland ecosystem engineering uh, impacts that they will have and I guess also that they will continue their natural range expansion. SSI was um, supposed to be laid in 2018, early in 2018. Can you give an, an idea of why there's been a delay and why it's only now that it's coming forward? Um, I think you know, it, it's primarily been about discussions with stakeholders. We could have pushed for the technical aspects, as I, that I mentioned before, but really we wanted to be sure that we were properly picking up the concerns of stakeholders and that we were developing the system. And, and they they pushed us hard. I mean, it, it is a significant thing. It is the first ever reintroduction of a mammal into the UK, so it's quite a significant step. And we, we really wanted to take the time to make sure we got it right. Uh, and... I guess we were also learning about the sort of impacts that beavers were having in areas like Strathmore, which is very intensively farmed, and I guess we hadn't quite appreciated the sort of impacts they would have until we started to see them on the ground. So there was, there was an element of learning for us, and I think for the, 
the farmers to, and it took time to come up with a system to deal with that. So it's really been a case of the delay being about working with the stakeholders to sort of like tease yeah. out some of their issues and get them to a place where they are comfortable with this uh, statutory instrument. Indeed, that's and right. The regulation yeah. change. Okay, Stuart Stevenson wanted to come in. Um, since the illegal release of uh, beavers in Tayside, we've seen significant impact. Uh, and I've just heard about the environmental assessments that have been done. Uh, but was there a parallel assessment of the economic impact? Uh, because obviously for farmers, um, this unplanned and unmanaged introduction was non-trivial. Uh, but equally, of course, there are the potential positive economic impacts. But it, it does strike me that, that there should have been an economic impact assessment and indeed a financial assessment uh, that relates to the costs uh, that government might find itself incurring. Was, was all of that done on the back of this illegal release? Uh, at at the, the time of the decision in 2016, there was uh, a report done on, I think it was called Beavers in Scotland, and that had a socio-economic analysis aspect to it, and that looked both at Tayside and at the original release site in Knapdale. Um, I, I think the, the key thing, though, is, is that we have learned more since then, as Beavers have moved into areas of, of Tayside and as we have realised the sort of impacts that they can have, as I say, in the, particularly in these sort of areas such as, uh, as Strathmore, where there are particular sorts of field drainage systems and, and low-lying uh, land where people are, are farming in the, in the floodplain and so on. So that, that, that is something which we have learned. Um, I, don't, I think it's quite difficult for us to put a figure on that. And I think in terms of the way that we would like to approach it is to prevent damage rather than to, to, to pay or to compensate for damage caused. So that's really been the focus of our work on, on the management system. I should also mention, I neglected to mention that we've also been joined by Edward Mountain, who's the convener of the uh, Rural Economy Committee. So sorry, I, I forgot to do that. And now on to questions from Mark Ruskell. Thanks. Um, can I turn then to the management framework? And could I ask SNH uh, about what legal tests will need to be satisfied in order to issue licenses for lethal control or other interventions and how those relate to the requirements in the Habitats Directive? Um, the, the, there's three basic licensing tests, if you like, um, before you intervene to do something that would otherwise be an offence. The first of those is that there is a purpose within the legislation for which you can grant a licence, so the need to, to um, intervene, um, whether that meets one of the purposes. And there are, there are uh, eight or ten different purposes um, within the legislation, the most likely ones for the cases that we've seen um, are about preventing serious damage to crops um, and, and agriculture more, more widely um, or other forms of property or infrastructure there or if there's anything about preserving public health or public safety. So, so there's a number of different purposes. Those are the two likely, most likely um, purposes for which you would use. That's the first test. The second test is whether there is a satisfactory alternative to having to go down the route of, of, of carrying out something, as I say, that would otherwise be an offence. And the third test is the assessment of whether those actions that are being carried out are likely to um, compromise the, the conservation status of, of, of beaver populations. So are those compatible with the Habitats Directive and have you sought a view from the European Commission on that? We haven't sought a view from the European Commission on this, but they are compatible. That, that's what they, they, those um, tests apply to all European protected species and we have a range of European protected species already present in, in Scotland and that we are already um, well versed with, with managing. Mm -hmm. So we have to use those tests all, all, all of the time for, okay. for hundreds of licences ev every right. year. But you haven't sought specific views from the European Commission on this? No, we, we've referred to Europe. Europe has a lot of guidance out there about how, right. to, how you operate with derogations. Okay. Um, 
So the government wrote to NFUS Scotland last week, and I'll read you the, the text of it. They say that they guarantee that any farmer experiencing or anticipating problems from beavers on prime agricultural land will be given licenses to manage beavers if they are required. Um, I mean, how can the government guarantee that the issue of licenses will be in line with this key principle that it's, uh, that it's you know, lethal control will be a last resort? There's a, a couple of aspects to that. I think, first of all, um, there is you know, this word, if, if required. I mean, that, I think, is uh, there is contingent on there being a need for a licence. So we would, uh, as, as, as Ben has explained, if it meets one of the purposes. Um, I think the second aspect that, that I'd want to just mention is, is that um, we have, in discussions with the farmers in areas like um, you know the intensively part, farm parts of, of Tayside, like Strathmore or Strathern, we have agreed with them that that some of the tests don't need to be replicated for every single application. We understand now that um, there are no satisfactory alternatives for some uh, aspects of, of, of beaver impact that need to be managed. Uh, and I think that is that is not a novel thing. It it's, happens in other areas of licensing. Uh, the actual test requires the licensing authority, that is SNH in this case, to be satisfied that there is no satisfactory alternative. It doesn't require the license applicant to demonstrate every single time that they have tried every, set, every other alternative. So if the licensing authority, such as SNH, say, well, we understand this situation very well, we've it, these license applications are identical. They're about, for example, burrowing into riverbanks which protect uh, vulnerable farmland, <coughs> or they're about blocking field drains which cause waterlogging of fields. We understand that situation. You don't need to, every single time, replicate the arguments which are used. So we're saying where those arguments have been made and where uh, ben and his colleagues have discussed with farmers, those farmers can expect that they will get a license. They don't need to continually restate the arguments every time they make an application. Uh, will there be transparency over the licensing regime? So in the way that we have transparency for seal culling through Marine Scotland licenses, will there be transparency from SNH as to who has the licenses, how many beavers have been translocated, how many have been lethally culled, what kind of measures are being put in place, or is that going to be closed off? We, ha we have to report back on, on, on our um, licensed activities as a whole anyway. There are limits to the, to the information you can provide at the, in, at the individual level, and there's the data protection um, legislation there about identifying individuals. But we should be able to provide the, the details of what we are licensing more, more broadly, but being very careful that we're not, we, we're not providing people's so would, would that be at the level of detail of the seal culling licensing regime that Marine Scotland manage? I'm not familiar with exactly what the level of detail that's provided. I think it'd be useful if you, I, I, with respect, I, mean, I think it'd be useful if you could write back um, to, to the committee with, with details of how this licensing regime is going to be transparent and what it will cover okay. in terms of reporting. Yeah. Can I bring in some supplementary questions on this particular line of question? Finn Carson. First Thank you. Um, why should stakeholders, farmers and landlords have any confidence uh, in any framework or licensing scheme that's brought in, given the, the failure to prosecute and the wildlife crime, which was the illegal uh, translocation of beavers to an area out with the trial? So why would they have any confidence that you can ensure the licensing is fit for purpose when it's quite obvious there was an illegal movement of beavers that there's been no prosecutions. Well, I mean, I think basically they're two separate things, two separate issues. The, um, the appearance of beavers on Tayside was quite clearly the result of either illegal releases or at best, I suppose, people allowing, you know, they either deliberately or allowed animals to escape. They, it, we, it also seems that it probably wasn't a one-off event, uh, and it was difficult, I think, for us uh, as the authorities to actually to know when it had happened, and, and it was very difficult to, to 
to gather evidence. I mean, the, these issues were reported to the police. I think the police did investigate. Um, but it, the, the, these are incredibly difficult things to prosecute. It wasn't a clear one-off act by some person who could, who could be prosecuted. So I think it was always going to be difficult to pursue people on, on that basis. And I think, again, we've learned some lessons about how we need to manage that sort of situation. And we've strengthened law around that. And I think we're also more conscious of the need to keep an eye on people who have collections of, of animals or people who may have ulterior intentions in that respect. In terms of the licensing, mm -hmm. well, we, we, you know, I understand that licensing is sometimes a controversial subject. It's a controversial subject around certain species, but around a whole range of other species, it works on a pretty routine sort of basis. Uh, and I think there is a broad degree of trust that, you know, where the, 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 in those sort of situations that SNH and Scottish Government are reliable partners and we've worked you know over the last two years as, as I mentioned to the convener in building relations with NFUS and assuring them of our intentions and I hope and think that they are pretty reassured by what we've had to say to them on this so I think in many ways the proof of the pudding will be in the eating and we'll see how that goes. I mean, that's, there's, also, there's the legal side of things, and there's also best practice as well. And I think partly uh, in response to the experience of the beaver situation on Tay side, and indeed the white-tailed eagle situation as well in particular, through what happened when learning from that experience, we um, brought together many of the land use and conservation organisations interested in conservation translocations in general through a body called the National Species Reintroduction Forum to try and talk together about how to think ahead, how we can be more strategic and planned, and utilise best practice more. And out of that process, we developed um, something called the Scottish Code for Conservation Translocations, which has been signed up to by all the forum members on the land use side and, and the conservation side. So it's, it's very much trying to promote best practice based on internationally recognised guidelines and ensuring that practitioners are very careful about preparing properly, uh, consulting with stakeholders, ensuring the legal elements are addressed and so on. And that was published in 2014. Um, thank you, convener. Uh, I just want to go back to the, um, the, the, the non-lethal controls, the translocation of beavers um, to um, non-prime agricultural land. <clears throat> and my view is that that will just effectively spread beavers, presumably, across Scotland to parts of Scotland that they wouldn't otherwise have gone to. Um, I note that it's um, prime agricultural land is land quality from 1 to 3.1. Um, the bulk of Scotland is non-prime agricultural land, and so they are going to ha have a different regime. Is that correct? Is my understanding of that correct? That they will have a much... <clears throat> they will be expected by... And the prime agricultural land will be protected from the ravages of the worst, uh, but the non-prime agricultural land will be expected to carry the burden of this um, species reintroduction. Is that, is that a fair assessment? Um, I don't think so. Um, the different standards, anyway. Well, uh, it, it, our assessment of it would be that, I mean, first of all, translocation is not considered to be a primary management tool. It's, it's a difficult tool to use. There are welfare concerns for beavers that are translocated. And as you have indicated, there are always going to be issues about where we release beavers which are translocated. And it's definitely not the intention of ministers to seek to expand the range of beavers by translocation. So that is definitely not going to so happen. where will you put them then? Well, as I say, we're not actually planning to translocate a lot of beavers. There will be issues where uh, translocation does is, is the right solution. But that will be really dependent on being assured about the costs of it, because it's quite an expensive technique, being assured about the welfare aspects of it, and of course, most important, being assured that there are suitable release sites. So, as I say, it's not, it's not really the, the, the prime uh, way that beavers can be managed. In terms of um, talking about other areas bearing the brunt of, of, of beaver uh, reintroduction, I think that the key issue here is, is that the sort of prime agricultural land that we're talking about in places like Strathmore and other similar areas 
they are particularly vulnerable to beaver impacts because it is low-lying land, it's very flat land, and that land is susceptible to flooding. It's often close to a riverbank and so on. As you move up the hillside, any land where there's a gradient, beavers inevitably will have less of an impact in terms of flooding. There won't be the uh, issues about um, blocking field drains and, and flooding fields in the same way. With, with respect, and I should have declared an interest as a mm. farmer, but forgive me, it's not just in the primary agricultural land or the drainage systems um, in, that outflow into river systems. Forgive me, but that's, a, sure, that's, I, that's no, an I'm, odd I'm thing to say, if you'll forgive me. Hugh, I've known you for a long time, but you know as well as me that there are field drainage systems that exit on, into rivers right across the whole of Scotland and not just in primary agricultural land. But I think it's, it's the issue is where you have the uh, long, very uh, low gradient field drain ditches, which can be blocked by beavers, and the level rises in those and thus stops the drainage from the field. I, I'm not sure that that particular phenomenon takes place so readily where you have some sort of gradient on the land. All you need to do is block the drainage mouth, and that's the drain blocked, and the drains will backfill, self-evidently. Well, I mean, um, if, 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 if that is the case, well, then mm. the, the beaver uh, licensing and management uh, arrangements will, will come into play. Mm. But what we've seen in other parts of the world, in other parts of Europe, is that it is particularly the sort of flat, low-lying land, which is particularly susceptible to, to beaver impacts, that farmers who are farming on, on a hillside where there is more more drainage, uh, see less of those impacts. And we would expect that to be broadly similar here. I'm not saying there are, that we know impacts or that there is no field drainage in those systems. I'm just saying that we would expect as a general rule that the impacts will be less in those areas. And farmers may well, I would hope, find that it is easier to tolerate living alongside beavers uh, in those sort of situations. Can I ask? From the licensing perspective there is, is that the, the, the fact that we have this approach proposed for prime agricultural land does not preclude licenses on, on other areas of land, as you say, and those tests that I referred to earlier still apply. So if there are impacts that are threatening the livelihood of farmers there, the, the ability to license activities from um, including dam manipulation uh, to resolve whatever issues being there will still will still apply and we still propose to be able to send out expert advisors to be able to go out and visit farms to look at that and come up with solutions to those to those problems the only difference with the prime agricultural land is that we're saying we recognize through experience the value of that land and, and the, the ease by which um, impacts of beavers ca can have an impact on Can I ask a question yeah. around, just from background, because I wasn't on the committee when you were doing, we were all doing the deliberation list. When you have made the decision, if, if you are going to, to translocate beavers into a certain area, what, ha what is the process? Who, who do you let know? What, what kind of consultation is there around there? What, what um, you know, what, what happens with the, your, your uh, correspondence with the people that might be affected? There actually haven't been many translocations. So to date, we had the translocations at Knapdale for the Scottish Beaver Trial, which is a mm. licensed uh, translocation. The situation in Tayside didn't really come out from translocations. They came out from some form of, well, they would have, you know, we're not quite sure, but some sort of escape or unauthorised release. Within Tayside, I think I'm correct in saying there haven't, I think there might have been one or two small scale translocations to remove a problem beaver from A to B. Right. But in terms of your wider question as to how is decision making done, I mean, f from this point, I mean, it depends on the purpose of the translocation. So, for example, over the next few years, we're anticipating that there may be opportunities to do what we call conservation translocations, which is where you move an animal for conservation purposes. So we anticipate, for example, having an opportunity to move a certain number, a small number, up to 28 animals from Tayside to Knapdale as part of a licensed translocation process, uh, which is quite rigorously done. It has to go through the Scottish Code for Conservation Translocation process I mentioned before, which is looking at all the biological and socioeconomic risks and benefits, making assessments of those, planning on mitigation, doing your health screening and so on, 
and then doing the translocation through you know, appropriate workers. Um, as far as other sites we anticipate might happen in the future, well, in fact, interestingly, there's a, quite a lot of interest in England at the moment about beaver releases, and we are liaising with our colleagues down south about the potential of some translocations of Tayside animals to the south. We're waiting for further details. But again, if they do request that, it'll have to go through the, the code approach again, the same sort of process as I mentioned before. So it's quite a rigorous exercise. Um, but there's the opportunity here of using beavers from situations, for example, on southeast Tayside, where there is a management problem. So you're mm -hmm. sort of addressing a management need, but then providing a conservation purpose. But what is important to emphasise is that this is probably quite a short-term thing. There will come a point when there won't be the opportunity to find release sites anymore, and we'll have to find alternative ways of managing the beavers. So at the moment, there are places we might have to release them, Napdale or potentially England, but that will probably only that opportunity will probably only be mainly around for the next few years, and of course the number of release sites will go down. Okay, I'm conscious that a couple of other people want to come in. Before I come back to John Edward Mountain, wanted to ask a question. Do you still want to? Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you, convener. And I uh, would like to make it clear that I attend this meeting as an individual, not as, a, as convener of the REC committee. And I was also like to declare an interest in that I'm a member of a farming partnership and also I have wild fisheries interest. Uh, I just want to push on on the translocation bit, if I may. Beavers tend to live in natural family groups, small family groups, translocating beavers. <coughs> from one location to another where there are no other beavers is relatively straightforward. Translocating beavers to areas where there are existing beavers will likely to cause further problems in that area. Could you just confirm to me that the government has no intention of translocating beavers from one catchment to another without considering all the interests and taking public consultation from all stakeholders involved? because there is a serious concern that uh, beavers will be moved from Tayside up into the Cairngorms uh, and could affect people there. Yes, I can confirm that would be the position. We would seek to ensure that all the relevant interests were properly consulted and viewpoints taken into account. There are no imminent plans. The, the focus right now, as far as ministers are concerned, is to uh, absorb and learn the lessons and learn how to manage be beavers where we've got them rather than seeking to expand their range by translocation. Do I get a follow -up? I, we don't have time. To, I'm, okay. I'm going back there. John Scott's got some additional questions. <coughs> how will, can I ask, um, thank you, Convener, how will SNH monitor the cumulative impact of lethal control on beavers, including on their ability to naturally spread? What is the baseline that this impact will be measured against? Do you want to talk about the survey, the, the, okay. the data that we already have? Okay. So, so we've, done two, we've done two surveys to date, one in 2012 and one in 2018, of beaver population on Tayside. So the most recent one, um, which was published in 2018, showed there were 114 beaver territories that we recorded within the Tayside area. It's probably, you know, it doesn't mean to say that we know of all of them, but that's a pretty, pretty decent estimate um, we have of the population. Um, so that represents maybe 320 to 550 animals. So um, we therefore any few we can that is our baseline in effect. So we can sort of use that uh, to to therefore um, make assessments of change in the future. So if we we have already used that 2018 survey to compare the previous 2012 sur survey to identify where there has been change in range, where there have been change in numbers of field signs, for example. So you can get a you can get an indication of where beaver populations are spreading or, in, or decreasing or increasing in terms of their sort of presence. And we can continue to use that methodology in the future to, to make assessments of, well, of change of beavers in general for, all, for whatever cause, and including the um, impacts of lethal control. Thank you. Um, from the, if this SSI is passed, presumably unlicensed lethal control of beavers will become a wildlife crime. Um, have there been discussions with Police Scotland about how unlicensed interventions will be approached in the initial period after regulations coming into force? I suppose at the same time you can maybe answer the question about further unlicensed um, additions of beavers um, being moved all around the country. Uh, what preparations are required to ensure the transition is made smoothly? 
and we're in, in elements of wildlife crime, you know, there's two different types of wildlife crime here. There's people moving beavers around the country and also uh, the lethal destruction of beavers. Um, we, I don't think we've had any specific discussions with the police on monitoring um, unlicensed killing of beavers at this stage. I think it's a point that we will be taking up with them. We, we do have good uh, ongoing relations obviously with police in the Tayside area around the issue of beaver management and that they've been involved alongside the beaver forum uh, where these issues have been discussed. In terms of um, further releases, I, again, I, I think, you know, we, as I mentioned earlier, we, we have uh, been very clear about the way that we see that. It, ministers have, have said that, you know, it, it's, a, it's an offence which is punishable. There's nothing you can do about it. Well, there's, there's, it's, it's difficult to do things about it uh, when you're learning about it several months or years after the event, which is what happened in Tayside. They chose not to resolve the problem at the time. Uh, they, well, they could have perhaps have resolved the problem by removing the animals, although there was, there was a, a judgment made on how practical that yes. was. So they chose not to do anything about it? They chose not to remove the animals. I didn't think they chose not to prosecute the people. There was an interest in exploring the extent to which it would be possible to pursue criminal offences. Yeah. Okay, thank you for the time being, Convener. Uh, Angus MacDonald. Okay, thanks, um, Convener. If I could turn to the issue of, of resourcing and um, ask the panel if what demand you, you're uh, anticipating for the issuance of licences and accreditation for, for lethal control, um, for example, based on any understanding of the, the current level of unregulated culling, and uh, are you satisfied that SNH can uh, meet the demand? We are, well, there's two, two aspects for that. One, one is about the licensing um, angle, the ability to issue sufficient licenses. I'm very confident that we can, um, uh, that we can do that. Um, we are organising the licensing team next week to start to develop the licenses and process the first, the first of those. Um, and we have a list of 15 to 20 farms at the moment who are wanting them, but we'd be hoping to work with um, NFU Scotland, Scottish Land and Estates and others to be able to, to make sure that people are fully aware of um, the framework and what the service we can offer, both in terms of licensing and advice and the mitigation scheme um, as well. In terms of the, the accredited controller training for, for lethal control, we have um, three training seminars already planned and booked um, in approximately two weeks' time. They will be starting, um, and we have. <coughs> excuse me. Um, I don't know whether we've got about possibly thirty people at the moment interested in in that. But again, I'm confident that we can meet the demand. Okay. Uh with regard to the training and guidance, um, are you expecting to, to have, have more of these at a later date? Yes, if, if, if there is demand for it, we can, we can deliver the training. Okay, and w specifically with regard to resources, um, what resources will be required uh, for, for you to fulfil the, the, the various uh, new functions, including the licensing accreditation uh, for lethal control and uh, also the provision of, of site-based advice, presumably there'll be a cost there. We've been providing site-based advice for, for five, or six, five or six years now, so we're relatively well versed about what, what that tends to cost us. We now have a mitigation scheme as well, and I expect that demand will, will increase there. We, we have um, money from Scottish Government um, to help fund the scheme. Um, we have about 40 cases at the moment that we're dealing with as potential scheme scheme cases and we're confident that we can deal with those and um, there is an unknown element to, to the levels of demand but as I say we, we, we have got five or six years history of um, experience of dealing with farmers 
primarily farmers, it's not all farmers, I should say. Um, so we, I, I think, yes, we, we've got the resources to be able to do that. Okay, that's good to hear. Um, staying with uh, the issue of resources, uh, Fisheries Management Scotland have highlighted that uh, beaver dams uh, can prevent the free passage of fish uh, and that some dams will need to be notched or, or removed by fisheries managers. Now, whilst the, the management guidelines allow such work to occur, uh, Fisheries Management Scotland have highlighted the significant resource implications in simply locating uh, the, the, the dams prior to any assessment of issues relating to fish passage. Uh, now, th this is clearly a new role for fisheries managers, which is not currently funded. Uh, do you recognise this concern, and do you agree that fisheries managers should be supported in undertaking such work in the future? We'll be, we, we are working with, with fisheries managers now to look at that. Part of the scheme is looking um, at, at trialling. It's not just about trialling various mitigation techniques, such as, such as dam manipulation, as you, as you say, but it's also about techniques of trying to predict where problems may occur, and we've got research um, ongoing about modelling where um, dams are likely to get built um, based on habitat characteristics and, and physical characteristics there. But we can also explore um, more novel techniques of, of being able to monitor um, water levels or um, try and use the predictions to be able to see if we can um, survey, provide efficient ways of surveying water courses to try and look for potential blockage areas. You say efficient ways, what kind of, how would you survey? Well, we've talked about, I mean, this is not just for fisheries, but for, for drainage as well, about automatic sensors for, for um, water levels to be able to see whether you can remotely um, do that and know therefore that a dam has been built in a, in a certain area there's been talk of drone use for looking for, for dams and the like but I think that's the point of the scheme is about coming up with innovative ways and we do that through our work with um, Fisheries Management Scotland and, and others and through the Scottish Beaver Forum as well to try and develop those approaches. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Mark Ruskell. The guidance that you've, you've drafted appears to allow the continued shooting of pregnant beavers um, by farmers and land managers um, and, and their kits um, during the dependency period. Um, why, why is there no closed season for lethal control in the guidance? There is a presumption against, um, the, or against control during that kit dependence period, but we have to recognise that some of these problems can occur at any time of the year, so a farmer can lose a quarter or a half of a, a field at any, at any time of the year, and that might coincide with the kit dependency period. What we've had to do is try and encourage that sufficient monitoring is going on to try and prevent that and get early action, but we acknowledge that sometimes it will happen, and therefore the methods that are subsequently used take account for minimising the welfare implications of, of those actions. So it, whilst it is not the preferred approach, we acknowledge sometimes it will be necessary and that will involve um, adapting how you, how you carry out that control to minimise those welfare impacts. Do you intend to issue licences for lethal control during the current kit dependency season in the run-up to May? If they are necessary, then yes. Okay. 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 Yep. Billy Carson. Um, I'm aware that the, the Scottish Beaver Forum and a technical group are looking at uh, a mitigation scheme. Can you give us an, an idea of uh, what the current status is with the scheme and what the process is for developing it uh, and, and let us know how stakeholders, including landowners, whatever, can get involved in the process. Um, the scheme is up and running. We've, we've got about 40 cases 
um, as I say, um, that we are looking at at the moment, approximately 50% of those are agricultural, um, and the remainder are um, about woodland damage, it's sort of even spread woodland damage, recreational, so path damage, riverbank erosion, residential um, issues. So we have those cases. Um, works have been carried out on a number of those. Works are planned for, for others. Um, so they're all in various stages of being dealt with. One was done last week about maintaining levels of water in a particular small reservoir. Um, we installed a, a, a device to, to um, manage the, the water levels there. We've got other fencing and exclusion um, options on going ahead on certain farms in Perthshire, um, protection of, uh, of garden and specimen trees, um, and uh, trials of excluding beavers from certain networks of um, watercourses and drainage ditches to try and alleviate problems that have been experienced in high-risk areas and remove the need for um, lethal control in those areas. So there are a lot of different streams that we're... Do you, do you see... A, we often hear the term now, public money for public goods. Do you see us moving towards uh, the mitigation scheme uh, incentivising our compensation or providing compensation for landowners that support beavers? So, for example, riparian uh, buffer zones or or uh, supporting beaver wetlands? Do you, do you see that as uh, landowners getting payments, for example? I'm not sure that's the mitigation scheme or whether that's the future of agri-environment um, arrangements, but I mean, maybe that's more for you, Hugh. Uh, no, I think that's right. I mean, we, we, we would expect in the future to see agri-environment schemes developing in that way, uh, where there would be sort of, uh, as you say, payment for, for public goods and that, yeah, very much so. Okay. okay. John, did you have some questions around this theme? Um, yes, I did. Um, I just wanted to ask about, go back to a question that was asked earlier about flooding and the ability of beavers to um, upset complicated hydrological uh, calculations for um, natural, um, <clears throat> um, natural flooding um, prevention. Um, I think particularly of Upper Teesside um, when the risk of of flooding to places like Perth um, <clears throat> and the complicated hydrology that it, in the flooding bill that was envisaged would have to be carried out around that and Beaver's ability to disrupt that in a, in a period of a fortnight. Um, how do you see that playing out? Because I think you were involved in the flooding bill, um, Ms. Adinia, along with me, and we know how um, about taking the tops off floods and beaver dams, by definition, are always full of water, otherwise they wouldn't be there. And therefore, they are not beneficial in any way in that regard, except for perhaps to slow down the rate of flow, but not in terms of capacity in the catchment area. How do you see that being dealt with, or is it being discussed at all? Well, there's a lot of speculation about it, but we don't see any evidence that beavers have caused flooding of that sort. Uh, so far, and I mean, it's very difficult to know, of course, um, and I, I'm not sure that there's much evidence from elsewhere either. But I mean, that there was, as you will know, the flooding in Ailith uh, a few years back, and there was a, a number of claims made around the p potential role of beavers in that. And I think that SEPA and SNH and Perth and Kinross Council carried out a pretty comprehensive in examination of that and found that be there were no beaver uh, impacts on that particular flooding. So I'm, I'm not really aware that, that there is any particular concerns about beavers causing flooding. As, as you say, there I'm are... I'm not suggesting causing flooding, yeah. but just um, making the, the hydrological calculations that have been done to take uh -huh. the tops off floods um, through natural flood prevention techniques, that they will thwart those good intentions, those delicate calculations. Well, I mean, you know, as I say, SEPA are members of the uh, Beaver Forum, and this is clearly their, their, their field, and, and we don't see any particular concerns expressed by SEPA with, with the position as, as it stands. So, I mean, I, I'm not an expert in that area. I don't really have anything further to, 
to say as the, okay. you know, the, the sort of super assessment of that. And now back to the scripted questions I've been given. What opportunities are there for this scheme to contribute to Scotland's wider 2020 biodiversity target? I mean, clearly, uh, you know, Ma Martin will, could say more about the detail, but you know, one of the prime reasons for being interested in beavers is, is because of their impacts as, as you know, ecosystem engineers and, and their ability to create wetland and the associated ecosystems and invertebrates, birds, amphibians, and so on, which come along with those wetlands. So, you know, we think that they will make a, a significant difference to the biodiversity of Scotland. Thank you. Thing about beavers is that they they are you know, being ecosystem engineers they can have there's a lot of evidence now which shows that they can have this quite a um, positive impact in biodiversity overall and they do that through the creation of these wetlands um, uh, coppice woodlands more patchy habitat more heterogeneous habitat um, for providing a more a greater range of habitat for a greater range of species uh, and so that, um, producing habitats, which some of which are sort of in decline in Scotland, more standing deadwood, more uh, fallen deadwood, um, more, more wetland areas, um, and, and so on. Um, actually, and just going back to the previous point about the flooding, if I may, um, I, I mean, I, I know we were talking about some of the negative impacts, and indeed, at a localised level, sometimes beaver flooding can cause a problem, but there is actually also a fair amount of evidence now which shows that there is potential for a role of beavers in natural flood management. I think we need to find out more about it. So there's some really interesting research coming down from Devon, where the University of Exeter have been doing work, which shows um, where beaver dams are operating, they're having a sort of a, a softening and attenuating effect on peak flow, uh, increasing water storage and so on. And indeed, there is actually a, a research bid at the moment to try and look at this in a, in a, in a bigger scale. And we're waiting for um, later on, for halfway through this year, um, the results of, of a, a research bit to see whether we can examine this in more detail, look at the potential of using beavers as, as a tool in natural flood management. I'd be very interested, I'm sure the committee would be very interested to see that piece of work. Um, thank you. Just a further question on that point. You mentioned about biodiversity, increasing biodiversity as a result of beavers be, being in their landscape. How are you going to monitor that? You know, I mean, if you get processes in place that you're going to be monitoring the effect that they do have on biodiversity. Yeah. So, uh, and I think the key thing is, yeah, overall, in, I think overall increase in biodiversity is what we're anticipating. Um, I think where we'll be focusing most of our attention will be on the natura sites, uh, in particular, uh, and there because we have an actually statutory role, I suppose, in terms of looking at the potential impact on beavers. We've also got to bear in mind that they can have some potential adverse impacts on the conservation interests as well, and so we need to acknowledge that. Uh, for example, um, uh, over at Napdell, there is an issue with the, the hazel, Atlantic hazel woodland, which is present there, but we're sort of we're monitoring the, the, the impact of the beavers on the woodland, and trying to mitigate, and, and also looking at the opportunities for um, replanting as well, sort of you're almost using the beavers as sort of um, almost a totemic species for creating more woodland in the area as well. But the the, the, if, if um, there are people out there that are translocating beavers illegally, they are interfering with that work because you're monitoring the areas where you know there are beavers and you're building the, the science uh, evidence around the, 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 the advantages of having beavers in, in Scotland. I mean, we've obviously, illegal releases of beavers is, is not a good thing in all sorts of different ways. Um, not least the fact that it undermines the whole process of being a professional conservation orientated process. Um, uh, and so that, hence the, the code approach I was talking about before, where we're trying to encourage a much more um, best practice approach in different ways. But, um, but yes, I mean, I think that clearly there's a lot of opportunity, I think, for, for monitoring biodiversity in more detail. Like I say, our focus is probably going to be mature sites for the meantime, simply because of resource issues among, amongst anything else. But I think there's also a lot of wider academic interest in the role beavers can play. And certainly, um, we've, had a, we've, we've worked with University of Stirling, for example, which have looked at the role of beavers in terms of biodiversity uh, and showing the sort of positive effects they can have. So there's a sort of a wider academic community interested in these impacts and there is work going on looking at those sorts of things. Thank you. Mark had a question. Um, it's, it's good to hear all, all of that, that positivity. And, you know, it's been quite a negative session in many ways. Um, can I ask you about um, the NFUS briefing to committee? It talks about um, preemptive work. Uh, on beavers, which suggests to me that there may be attempts to try and 
uh, prevent beavers from naturally spreading into different catchments. Is that, is that permitted? Will that be permitted under the guidance and the licensing framework? Because we are seeing beavers naturally moving into different catchments now. On the teeth where I live, for example, good evidence that there's beavers there, good evidence that they're spreading further down the teeth, potentially into the fourth. So what, what, you know, do you believe that's a preemptive work to prevent beaver populations from uh, developing in other catchments would, would be something that would be allowed or would that be illegal? I, can, I, can I just say on that, um, you know, the, the, the statement that ministers made back in November 2016 recognised that beavers would expand their range naturally and we weren't going to attempt to, to prevent that. At the same time, we're not going to be translocating animals to encourage that expansion. I mean, say for the time being, the beavers are there in quite significant numbers in Tayside. We recognise that they are expanding their range into the fourth catchment and, and so on. I don't think that that's what the NFU were referring to. I think that they were referring to preemptive work on farms where they're anticipating that there will be damage uh, from from beaver activities and to try and put in place measures to, to preempt that. And as I say, that is very much in line with a policy that we want to adopt, which is about prevention of damage rather than seeking to, to cure or deal with damage after the event. To add to that, that, that preemptive work, there's a. I agree that that was not my take on what, what on what it, the intention was. But there is some work already that has been done or um, is underway about trying to anticipate those areas where greater issues may be caused, and that is about things like modelling where dams may be likely to be to be built. As I say. There's been some preliminary work done about looking at um, flood embankments and potential um, risks that, that beavers may pose to those. They the, were the sorts of preemptive works that I understood. Right. Okay. Okay. Stuart Stevenson. Uh, thank you very much. I think we can deal with this fairly briefly. Um, we've got 550 animals on Tayside. I think I have the previous evidence there, uh, which is uh, pretty clear evidence of a successful self-sustaining population. But I believe it comes from a relatively f small number uh, of antecedents. Is there sufficient genetic diversity in the, uh, in the population? And, and indeed, do I recall correctly that the Napdale population is Norwegian, whereas the Tayside is Polish? So therefore, there is that diversity there. Is that correct? So the Napdale animals are Norwegian animals. And so the Norwegian animals were all Norwegian. The, the ones on Tay side, now bearing in mind we don't know exactly where they came from, but what we've, we've worked out so far, we're pretty sure that most of them originally would have come from Bavaria. And the Bavarian animals themselves were a result of translocations from various places across Europe, because they became extinct in, in Bavaria in the, uh, uh, previously and were reintroduced in the mid-20th century. So in answer to your question, uh, Napdale, I think, when we first started doing this work um, over at Napdale, I think originally the Norwegian animals were decided upon based on the sort of morphological studies of bone and so on. We now have these genetic tools, which are a fairly novel new thing. Uh, and yes, we are, there are issues about the fact that they are not genetically uh, uh, are diverse enough in, in, in uh, Napdale, and so we have been using Tayside animals for the reinforcement exercise which is going on. And we felt that the, the risk of inbreeding was too great, and that it was, useful to, it was good, therefore, to bring in uh, Tayside animals. In terms of Tayside themselves, the Tayside animals there, um, as I mentioned before, we don't know the origin of them, but there have been genetic tests done of the animals present. I think it's uh, fair to say that the, the genetic diversity is probably limited. Um, it may be an issue down the line in terms of their genetic health and therefore the impact that might have on their physical health and so on. I think the jury's out on that one a wee bit and I think it's probably a question of keeping an eye on it. Um, uh, overall, the, the, it, within Europe there are some populations which are extremely inbred. I mean, there are 50,000, over 50,000 beavers in Norway now which all came from probably less than 100 animals, by, which were there in 1900, and yet they appear to su suffering, so no, showing no obvious physical problems or issues at the moment. Um, so I think the Tayside situation, it's a matter of having a bit of a watching breeze, keeping an eye on them, 
monitoring their genetics and their health. And if, for example, it turned out there was some particular issue that was beginning to become a problem for them, there might be an argument for bringing in some more st from other stock from other populations to you know, bolster their genetic health. Um, let me just finally move on to a, a question, particularly for Hugh Dignan. Um, we're looking at uh, a particular piece of regulation here. Uh, is there anything in this regulation that would suggest that it would remove the rights of anyone affected by illegal uh, release of beavers uh, to use the civil courts to seek redress from the people who might be thought to be responsible if you're affected by them? I don't think so. I would, I would That's the answer I expected. I just wanted to get up the record. Yeah. Thank you. We have a couple of minutes left, and I'd like to bring in Edward Mountain to ask a question. Thank you. Uh, just going through some of the uh, things that are suggested to help uh, manage beaver activity in river, outside river. Some of them will be in contravention of controlled activity regulations. If a license is given and farmers are to be de uh, to uh, carry out these work. Who will pay for the car license? I'd be interested to see which ones you think need a car license. So not not all do. But if we uh, through the scheme, if we are, for instance, we're looking at a particular Watergate design in, in one set of um, in one burn and, and drainage um, network, um, we will sort out all of the the car as part of the scheme. We will um, arrange for the licensing requirements to be met. And okay. pay for those. Okay, but I mean, to put, a, to put a machine in the river to remove a dam or breach a dam, prevent burrowing, sheet piling, rock armour, mesh to prevent burrowing, all would be in contravention of a car licence, or a car licence would be required. My experiences of car licences, they're expensive, they're time consuming, and somebody's got to pay for it. My question, Ben, particularly to you, is will the government be paying for that car licence or will they be waiving the fees for farmers who have to deal with it? Well, I think, with due respect, that's probably a question for you, for you as well, whether the government will be paying for it. But I, I would say, so removal of dams, for instance, yes, you would require a, a, a car licence if you are using a, an excavator within in-stream there, mm. but most of the work to do that that I am aware of is carried out from the bank uh, using machinery again, and that doesn't require a, a car license. So there are a lot of these things I would say again that do not actually require a car license. So Hugh, will, will the government be paying for a car license if required? Well, it hasn't come up yet. Uh, um, I would just like to sort of say we'll, 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 we'll think about that. So the, the experience that we've seen for, from, from Ben, uh, as Ben is saying, is that at present car licences don't seem to be required. Most, most dams are on small burns and you wouldn't be able to get an excavator into the burn really. It, it's, it's more a matter of whether it's by hand or by a machine from the bank. That's what we've seen. Uh, and as I said earlier, SEPA have played a role throughout in the uh, Scottish Beaver Forum and have been aware of these discussions and have advised that they don't anticipate, as a general rule, car licences being required. I mean, they say that there may be circumstances where a car licence is required, but I'm not aware that we've had one of those yet, except in areas where perhaps where we're looking at, at, at trialling mitigation measures, as Ben mentioned, with the, with the gates. And there, as I say, we will we'll be paying for the car licence as part of that. But I, I think it would be something we'd want to look at uh, on, on a case-by-case -case basis at this stage. I mean, I think with a lot of this, it really is about um, learning as we go along and seeing exactly what is required, what the costs are, and, and so on. I think uh, that, that's how we would see the situation at the moment. OK. Thank you. Um, John's got a quick question, and I'm going to ask a final question before I, I let you all go. Um, I'd just like to ask you about um, Norway. It was mentioned by one of your colleagues, and you say there are 50,000 beavers in Norway. I just wonder how they're perceived by the land users in Norway, uh, and what is the distribution in Norway? Are they all confined to the, the better agricultural land, or are they, are they distributed widely across the country, or does the latitude affect their distribution? What, what I mean, are the lessons to be learned from Norway? I think one of the first things to say about Norway, is, of course, is that they're not part of the European Union. 
in terms of so the, the sort of European protected species status doesn't apply in Norway. Beavers are uh, hunted there regularly without the need for license. I'm not so sure about the distribution. I think Martin is probably better place to talk about that. I mean, they're quite widely distributed through Norway, especially in the southern half of Norway. Um, certainly not just agricultural land. In large parts of the, I mean, the large part of the country is quite forested, um, so they're using a lot of that sort of habitat. Um, so yes, they're quite widely distributed. Are they welcome in Norway? Um, uh, my impression is that broadly, yes. Uh, they do inevitably cause problems in some areas. Um, Norwegians are quite pragmatic. They will go in and manage them in different ways, often involving culling. Um, but broadly speaking, yes. Uh, and, and I think interestingly for us is that it doesn't, I mean, they, they have salmon rivers present in Norway as well. And the fishery managers on the Norwegian rivers don't consider beavers to be a problem. Now, I appreciate there are differences between Norwegian rivers and the Scottish rivers, but that is an interesting aspect in itself. And there's a bit of discussion between ourselves and the Norwegians about you know, what's going on in terms of their rivers with salmonids uh, and beavers present and, and what might happen here as well. So it's, I think broadly speaking, though, in answer to your question, it's yes. And finally, are there health and safety implications in terms of dam removal uh, where you can't get uh, excavators um, onto the banks of rivers and, and burns? <laughs> Um, uh, for individuals having to dismantle dams, presumably by hand, if there's no other way available. What are the health and safety implications of that? Who would carry the insurance for, for example, farm workers going on to this kind of project? No, I mean, we, we um, have... Especially where the beavers have been introduced illegally and with the acceptance, the tacit acceptance of the Scottish Government. I don't know what the insurance sort of implications are. We can go on and, and we can carry out some of these activities but, but, and can be insured to do so, but I don't know about the farmers. I'm sorry, I didn't hear what you said. But I don't, I don't know about a farmer going and, and removing those, how, what any liabilities are, if, you, if that's what you mean. Uh, indeed it is what I mean, yeah. Just a final question before I, I, I wind this session to a close. Um, the management framework, um, and it's picking up on some of the questions that Mark Ruskell asked, the management framework appeal, appears to rule out translocation as an alternative to lethal methods of, if, there's, if there's a problem. Can you see any circumstances where translocation would be used instead of culling, given a culling licence? Translocation is, is being used now. In, in some cases, so where where it, it will be an option, there will be a suite of options, not not just lethal control either. There will be other management options, but um, we have a translocation policy um, that um, is saying that where, for instance, where Martin says there's a recognised conservation project um, that can be a receptor for it, that we can we can do that and permit translocation there, but it. That is, that is limited. There, there, are, there is the Naptail proposal and, and there are animals being moved now, animals that may be causing problems on Tayside are being moved, moved to Napdale. But that is limited in the number of animals that you can move. There are projects from down south um, that we think are, are, are likely to be coming up shortly, which again, we will be able to work with license holders or farmers to, um, to be able to say we can remove these animals rather than reverting to lethal con or you get to the point where you might have to well uh, issue there is those account. those options are there but you also have to say that translocation is not without its own risks as well translocation has very real welfare implications as well associated yeah. with, with 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 capture okay. um, as well as practical okay. considerations as well Okay, I want to thank you all for the time you've spent with us today. I'm going to suspend this meeting briefly to allow the gallery to be cleared. Let's move on to the next session. Thank you.
The second item on the agenda is to hear evidence from the Cabinet Secretary for Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform and her officials on the Conservation Natural Habitats EU Exit Scotland Amendment Regulations 2009. The Cabinet Secretary is accompanied this morning by Stephen Dora, Policy Manager, Michael McLeod, Head of Marine Conservation, and Norman Munro, Scottish Government Legal Director. Good morning to you all. Um, I have an initial question to ask the Cabinet Secretary. Um, what informal consultation has the Scottish Government undertaken in drafting these regulations and what issues were raised? Um, well, there was no statutory requirement to consult uh, formally, um, but what we did do was engage with stakeholders in the short time that is available. People will understand that. Um, and we did take comments on board. So the drafting changes were made in response to comments um, on the importance of consulting SNH for the purpose of issuing guidance. And officials also worked with key partners, including SNH, to ensure amendments will work for Scottish interests. And we've engaged with DEFRA, obviously, and other UK administrations on the content of equivalent UK statutory instruments where similar technical amendments are being made. So we, we, we spoke to uh, uh, um, uh, others about this, but we obviously don't have enough time to do any formal consultation around this. So there has been some discussion, yes. Thank you. And the questions from Finlay Carson. Uh, good morning. Um, we know that there's a, a wider Scottish Government consultation taking place on the governance gaps. Uh, can you set out what the government's view is on uh, what extent these regulations can achieve equivalence with uh, arrangements uh, the EU arrangement at the moment, and where are the outstanding governance gaps? Well, we don't really see there being um, uh, huge governance gaps. Effectively, we're taking the European Commission out of the picture for purposes of a post-Brexit scenario, um, but all of the various reporting requirements pretty much stay um, uh, as you would expect. So we don't actually uh, anticipate there being uh, uh, a, a governance gap in the sense that people think that there is going to be a big, uh, a big problem. The um, equivalence uh, with current arrangements is achieved by this. Um, in a sense, it's what this is about. This is about creating uh, equivalence. Um, so there's no change to the existing policy approach, and we've only made any changes that we consider to be absolutely necessary. Um, so all the protections and standards that we currently have provided by the Habitats Directive and the relevant bits of the Wild Birds Directive are retained for this legislation. Um, so it, it, it's really about ensuring that the existing protection regime can in fact continue to work effectively, that this, that this um, uh, SSI is about. Um, I mean, obviously, regulations will not be exactly the same as they are because that's not possible outside the EU. Um, and, uh, but what we've got to have available is something which can operate effectively at 11 p.m. on the 29th of March if that is the appropriate time or whenever that might be. Um, and that's what this is very much that technical fix. So you're confident that the proper governance structures yes. will be in place to, to enforce yes. uh, the rules? OK. Um, Specifically with regards to the process for designating special areas of conservation, does the government consider the new process, um, which we know requires a consultation uh, with nature conservation agencies, um, does it achieve the equivalence to the current situation? Um, or do, do you foresee any gaps uh, through losing oversight from the, e the EEC uh, that need addressed? Well, um the process for designation achieves equivalence with the current situation. That, again, is what this is designed uh, to do. Um, they do the bare minimum uh, to that designation process to ensure that it remains operable. So again, what is being done is simply to ensure operability at whatever the trigger time uh, actually is. We will continue to act on the advice of SNH um, and the JNCC um, when we're doing the designations uh, following, and we will be following the criteria provided by the Habitats Directive, uh, notwithstanding Brexit. So we've simply replaced the function currently provided by the European Commission at the next to last stage of the process. So effectively, again, this is literally just about fixing the, 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 the technical bit that needs to be fixed 
to make it operable immediately on a no deal or on a well any Brexit actually not just a no deal Brexit. Okay. Thank you, Angus Macdonald. Um, convener, uh, for the record, Cabinet Secretary, how do you see the, the European Commission's function in scrutinising reports currently submitted under the Habitats Regulation being replaced following EU exit? Well, I think we've already spoken um, yeah. a little bit about that. That's about the reporting duties that I mentioned, uh, uh, mentioned earlier. The, the, the reporting requirements are intended to sure, uh, um, ensure, again, that at a minimum, they reflect those set out in Article 17 of the Habitats Directive and Article 12 of the Wild Birds Directive. So we will report publicly on the implementation of the regulations within six years from the date of exit and every six years um, thereafter. And again, that's what's where we are uh, at present. We don't think it's appropriate to set out the format in the regulations because um, that would introduce a counterproductive degree of restriction um, effectively, what we've done is observe the format for EU reporting changing over the years. So, again, we're just lifting what we do and, and, and putting it into the regulations to ensure that we can continue to do it uh, again after the, 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 the trigger point of Brexit. Thanks. And in the absence of EU reporting, how will the Scottish Government and SNH approach uh, assessing and comparing biodiversity trends in Scotland with, well, the, rest, we'll with to the rest take, of Europe? Well, I mean, we will continue to take um, uh, uh, advice um, uh, on this. The reporting requirements, again, are, are, are closely uh, aligned. We'll, uh, um, we are going to... Uh, the UK as a whole will continue to report on a similar basis uh, as it does now. Um, they're a contracting party to the Berne Convention, and it's worth remembering that there are other interna international conventions um, surrounding a lot of the work we do in environment that are not reliant on the EU. Um, uh, there's been, I guess, a focus on the EU connection, um, but we need to remember that there are other conventions uh, that apply. Um, at the point of any Brexit, uh, the UK will continue to contribute to that burn convention emerald network um, and the reporting requirements again as I said before are closely uh, aligned so comparison with published EU reports will still be possible okay thank you thank you Mark Ruskell thanks um, in terms of existing guidance at EU level on interpreting and applying the the directives are, are any of those still to be brought into domestic guidance I'm sorry, I don't understand what you mean by that. Will any of the existing guidance uh, at, the EU, at the EU level that relates to the Habitats Directives, are those still to be brought into domestic guidance? Um, well, I don't, I don't think, I mean, unless there's something very specific that you're referring to, the answer to that would be, I don't think there are anything, there's nothing that's waiting to be brought in. There's nothing in. to be transposed. There, there's nothing, we're not in the middle of doing anything, if that's right. what you mean. We're not in the middle of doing something that might be affected by Brexit. So um, uh, there's no, there's no kind of, there's nothing that can run at cross purposes, if that's what you're, you're, you're so We're you're fully thinking. aligned. We're fully aligned we're at the moment. Um, there's nothing new being suggested at the moment that looks like it would, you know, give us an issue on. Now, I can't speak, obviously, if, if the actual Brexit doesn't happen for another 21 months or two years or whatever. I can't speak for the position that might occur at that point, um, but I can only speak about now. And effectively, this is a preparation for a no deal Brexit, and we're having mm -hmm. to do it on this time scale for the 29th of March to make sure that we're in, in a solid place for the 29th of March. So right now, the answer to that is no. Um, I haven't, I'm not aware of anything on the horizon that might fall into that category. But of course, I can't rule out some possibility that might be, if Brexit is delayed considerably, that there might be something that emerges in that time. But we're committed to doing the work that is necessary. Mm -hmm. So in terms of the powers then that are in this SI to issue guidance on the interpretation, um, will you be issuing guidance straight away? Uh, we will be working uh, what, on what, guidance. What we'll, be doing that. On that? we'll be doing that as soon as, uh, as, as, soon as is manageable, yes. But, I mean, the intention is to do that sooner rather than later. How, how quickly after? Well, I, you know, with the greatest of respect, officials at the moment are probably quite busy just getting all of this done. So we're, um, uh, uh, the publication at the moment will be when this comes into effect. So right. 
it Australia. won't be published in advance or I mean because obviously unless Brexit happens this doesn't ha th this instrument will not happen yeah. unless Brexit happens yeah. Yeah. so there isn't a separate publication schedule for the guidance separate from this instrument um, and um, the plan is that in the longer term we will we will review and update existing Scottish guidance uh, but the guidance that goes along with this particular instrument will be published at the time the instrument comes into force, and I, I have no idea when that might be. Right, okay, that's a useful clarification. I had one more question, and that was a concern around the introduction of a proportionality test into the regulations in relation to the way that sites are managed, not designated. This does seem to be quite a significant divergence from what is currently in the Habitats Directive. Um, I understand that it is aligned with what DEFRA wish to do, uh, but it does raise, in my mind, some significant concerns around uh, the appropriateness of, of management actions on, on protected sites and whether we could end up downgrading some of that much-needed management work. That's not the intention. Can you, can you reassure me as to why this proportionality test is in there? It's a new thing. Why is it in there? Well, we're not going to introduce the possibility of permitting activity in protected sites that would otherwise not be allowed. The use of the term is proportionate is intended to reflect the relative importance of habitats and species within the UK on an international scale. Um, it's clearly defined in the regulation to mean the relative importance of the part of the natural range lying in the UK's territory and the part of the natural range lying outside the UK's territory. So it doesn't invoke the EU general principle of proportionality um, in this context. It, it's effectively about protecting habitats and species that are of international importance and significant in the UK. Um, and that's what this is about. Can I just ask, is this about the Scottish Cross Bill? No. no. <laughs> Sorry, there's an issue about the Scottish Cross Bill that I thought this might refer to and it doesn't, so... <laughs> I'm, sort of... um, I'm, I'm, I'm still not clear why there's a divergence between what is in the Habitats Directive and what is now appearing in this SI. It's bringing in a proportionality well, test in relation to management. Yeah. I, I'm, not, I'm sorry, Cabinet Secretary, I'm not clear by your answer well, what, what this actually means. Well, because there are things across the EU that are in, of great significance that may not be kind of habitat issues for the UK at all. And if we simply bring over the whole management without some reference to that reality, then we run the risk of disproportionately uh, um, applying rules to things that don't are not really the issues that we, we we need to be concerned about. So, you know, we don't I mean there are there are there are there are habitat issues and birds issues and all the rest of it on an EU wide basis, because we're working on an EU wide basis at the moment, all of which are regarded in that same way. But we won't be on that EU EU wide basis anymore. So we've just got to make sure that we can give um, proportionate importance to the to the Habitats issue and birds directive issues that relate to the UK is and an not to the rest where, of the EU. Is there an example of where that might apply? Where we want to set a different set of. It's not really about setting a different set. over a certain species it's, it's compared to about another. Because it's, it's quite a catch all, it's quite a broad thing to bring into this legislation. Yeah, do you want to pick that up, Michael? Okay, so, um, so the concept of favourable conservation status. Um, is an EU-wide concept, and it's done at EU level on a biogeographic scale, so we're in the Atlantic biogeographic region. So if you remove Scotland and the UK from that process, um, if you want to still uphold that, you have to define um, something uh, sort of in comparison to what the Habitats Directive currently says. And the Habitats Directive requires member states to make a proportionate contribution um, to the Natura network based upon the habitats and species that are listed in the directive and are found within their territory. Mm -hmm. um, so this principle, or, or how it's drafted, is trying to replicate um, the spirit of, of that provision in the directive. It's not about managing individual sites, it's about adapting the network as a whole to ensure that it's protecting uh, an appropriate range and proportion of each habitat and species that, that are found in Scotland and so the UK. What, 
excuse me, I mean, what, what you're describing there is in relation to designation, whereas this applies to management. Two different things. If you've got something that's designated, how you apply management proportionately is a different question to whether you would proportionally designate a species based on its range and biogeography and everything that you discuss. So why, why is it being applied to management rather than designation? It's not been applied to management. It's been applied to the, the adaptation of the network in the future. Right. The provisions for management of sites, which is in Regulation 48 of the original 1994 um, regulations, um, that is what transposes Article 6 of the Habitats Directive. That, that is the provisions in the Habitats Directive that requires you to um, take appropriate steps to ensure that sites are managed properly. Um, we haven't changed that regulation at all. That still stands for each and every site that we have uh, in the Natura, or what is currently the Natura network. And that provision will apply if we adapt the network to include further sites in the future using the new adaptation um, provision. Right, okay. John Scott. Uh, thank you, um, convener. Can I ask you, why does the power to introduce regulations to amend the schedules and annexes not include requirements to seek expert advice from statutory agencies? Um, Well, we will we will be seeking advice. I mean, there isn't there isn't a, 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 an intention not to. Um, any amendments will be made on the basis of scientific advice from nature conservation advisors. Um, uh, the power uh, taken is necessary to account for future possible technical and scientific progress, but we would always do that. I mean, it would probably be prompted by scientific advice rather than rather than the other way around. Um, we can issue guidance in future to clarify how that advice will be formally taken. Um, and obviously, we'll be working with other UK administrations to ensure consistency uh, across the UK. Um, any amendments would be subject to affirmative procedure. So there is every intention to take advice. It would be, well, of course, one wouldn't doubt your motives at all, Cabinet Secretary. Sorry, what? But, well, of course, one wouldn't doubt your motives at all, Cabinet Secretary, but it might be clearer if there was a specific requirement in place in the legislation. But anyway, um, can, can, uh, moving on to the next question, can you foresee... So the, the directive doesn't have it either. So I think we just need okay, to remember well, that all we are doing is effectively... Transposing. Transposing yeah. what exists and not creating new things yeah, yeah. over and above that. Take your point. <laughs> Um, can you foresee circumstances where Scottish ministers would amend the schedules or annexes to the birds or habitats directives in a different way from the rest of the UK? And would yeah. this still fall under a common framework given the regulations create a sure. UK site network? Well, you've just taken evidence for over an hour on precisely something that we are doing that is different to the rest of the UK. Um, and in fairness, um, Michael Gove also had to consider the possibility of reintroduction of links on an English basis um, that he was entitled to do. Um, uh, and, you know, the, the possibility of that kind of decision making is contained within the devolution of environment powers as is. So might there be some divergence? Um, yes, there might. There, there is, because we've reintroduced Beaver uh, um, formally, um, uh, or are in the process of doing so formally. Um, so they're kind of already arisen. There's nothing unusual. Would I expect there to be massive divergence? No, I, I wouldn't expect there to be massive divergence. The, you know, the odd thing coming up will arise out of the specific circumstances that exist uh, in Scotland. Um, we're obviously retaining all our current environment powers, um, but uh, um, there is an existing UK biodiversity framework in place. There's current discussions at official level about how we can uh, um, set up a, a sort of an agreement across the four administrations to ensure uh, um, at that more general level uh, things are managed properly. But can I rule out something? Well. No, given that you've just gone through a whole session 
on precisely a divergence. So, so then, to be clear, then there is latitude for divergence under a common framework, notwithstanding the fact that the regulations create a, a UK site network. There is latitude for divergence, and you've just yeah, given us a, the example. Yeah, there's a devolution of power, and, and that's, that's recognised, and that's always been the case. I mean, you know, we've been do, the, 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 the situation with the beavers is under the current uh. setup, not the future one. So it's, it's nothing, is, nothing new about the, the, this situation. Fine. Thanks very much. Stuart Stevenson. Thank you very much. Just a couple of tidy up points, uh, if I can put them this way. Uh, this, uh, terminologically, the Scottish regulations use the term UK site network to essentially replace Nutura 2000. The UK regulations uh, use national site network, and the Green Alliance have suggested that we should have a shared description, which is international site uh, uh, network. Um, have you any views on all of this? I, as I say, I think it's a comparatively modest point in my view. But Yeah, I mean, the definitions are the same. Um, uh, so the terminology is what's in question. And I, I don't think anybody would be surprised to discover um, that notwithstanding the England and Wales terminology of being national site network, that that would be a bit of a confusion for Scotland. Um, I'm suspecting, well wondering whether even Wales is particularly content with a national site network that covers both sides of the English-Wales border. Um, so we just thought to avoid there being an issue about the difference between um, national uh, in the UK context that we would simply use the designation UK site network to make that clearer when people were describing anything. Um, uh, as I said, the definitions are exactly the same. Um, and the same token, the UK uh, regulations, uh, are there any issues for the powers of Scottish ministers that derive from their regulations? Mm. I realise that's not directly related to today's discussion, but uh, as an adjunct to it. Uh, no, I think the answer to that is no. Um, the, the, their regulations um, uh, create no new powers which apply in Scotland. They haven't, uh, you know, crossed a line on any of that. So they're doing what they're doing there and it's the equivalent exercise to what we are doing here. That's fine, thank you. If that's all the questions that members have, is there anything that the Cabinet Secretary would like to say that she hasn't had a chance to say already? No? No. Well, thank you very much for your evidence of that. We'll move on to agenda, agenda item three. Uh, third item in the agenda is to invite the Cabinet Secretary to move motion S5M 16057 that the amendment, the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee recommends that the Conservation Natural Habitats EU Exit Scotland Amendment Regulations 2009 be approved. Moved. Thank you. Any comments from any members? So the question is that motion S5M16057 in the name of Rosanna Cunningham be approved. Are we all agreed? Yes. Agreed. Thank you. We are agreed. That's unanimous. Um, our fourth agenda. Oh no, hang on. We, we actually will suspend now. Thank you. For, thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary and your officials. We'll suspend briefly. Right. Our fourth agenda item this morning is to consider whether the following instruments have been laid under the appropriate procedure. The first instrument is the Environment EU Exit Scotland Amendment Regulations 2019, that's SSI 2019, oblique 26. 
And the second instrument is the Marine Environment Scotland EU Exit Amendments Regulations 2019, that's SSI 2019 oblique 55. Both have been laid under the negative procedure. And does anyone have any comments on either of those? Stuart Stevens? Um, I can't see any reason why they should be other than negative instruments. Anyone else got any points to make? No? So is the committee content for the instruments to be considered under the negative procedure? Yes. We are. So the instruments will be considered as part of the next agenda item to which we now come. The fifth, fifth, amendment on our, fifth item on our agenda today is to consider the follow, following negative instruments. The aforementioned Environment EU Exit Scotland Amendment Regulations 2019, SSI 2019, Oblique 26, and the Marine Environment Scotland EU Exit Amendments Regulations 2019, SSI 2019, Oblique 55. Any further comments in relation to the instruments? No. And are we agreed that we don't want to make any other recommendations in relation to the instruments? Agreed. We agreed. The sixth item on our agenda today is to consider the following negative instruments. The Wildlife and Countryside Act 1981, Keeping and Release and Notification Requirements Scotland Amendment Order 2019, that is SSI 2019, oblique 37, and the Wildlife and Countryside Act 1981, Prohibition on Sale, etc. of Invasive Animal and Plant Species Scotland Order 2019, that is SSI 2019, oblique 38. Are there any comments to make in relation to these instruments? No? Yes. yes. Sure. Um, I just note that uh, our briefing says the Scottish Government's working with the UK Government and other administrations on the implementation, and I welcome that. Thank you. Is the committee agreed that it does not want to make any recommendations on relations to these instruments? Thank you very much. That's agreed. At its next meeting on the 12th of March, the committee will hear from Police Scotland, the Crown Office and the Procurator Fiscal Service and the Scottish Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals on the Scottish Government's Wildlife Crime in Scotland Annual Report 2017. We'll now move into private session. I ask that the public gallery be cleared as the public part of this meeting is now closed. <laughs>